I sat before the TV set in my living room. I sat. I waited. I watched. I kept myself awake. This is Faye Weldon. And this is God, apparently, at the bottom of the spray can. The spray can is marked PKD, Philip K. Dick. It's quite safe. If you use as directed, but... The only problem is, there's no one anymore to direct us. I am on one of the most important quests a human being can undertake. It is nothing less than an updating of the concept of divinity. I'm looking for clues to an invisible being of great size whose outline is dim, but to me, real. It hides itself and has the ability to delude. There's no reason to suppose that it mimics humans, but rather inanimate objects. Phil was worried about spiritual matters. He was worried because I wasn't baptized. So I went to a Baptist church and got dunked that Sunday. But that still left our son. Christopher's favorite meal for lunch was a hot dog and Ovaltine. Phil put the hot dog aside because meat wouldn't be appropriate for a baptism. He dipped his finger in the Ovaltine and drew a cross on Chris's forehead with it. And then he gave him a bite of the hot dog bun and a drink of the Ovaltine. So it was, Chris then had his baptism and first communion and that kind of made him a member of the church and safe from demons. What happened to Philip K. Dick in February and March 1974 defies easy summation, but the sum total was that Philip K. Dick felt he had been perhaps contacted by something higher, something that could make reality cohere for him. B-A-L-I-S means Vast Active Living Intelligence System, and uh, that was his name, or one of his names, for that which he felt had contacted him. It led him to produce a very, very brilliant novel, Vallis. You can see it as an account of what spiritual chaos is in our day and age. Horse lover Fat told us that God had fired a beam of pink light at him. Horse lover Fat was actually in search of the dead girl Gloria, for whose death he considered himself responsible. He had totally blended his religious life and goals with his emotional life and goals. For him, savior stood for lost friend. Horse Lover Fat is a name that derives from uh, Philip K. Dick's analysis of his own name. Philip, apparently from the Greek lover of horses, and Dick, the German word for fat. You can find in Vallis that the dialogues between Horse Lover Fat and Phil, the two aspects of himself, are a brilliant self-examination and a kind of satiric uh, spoof of his own beliefs. I love the bravery of Vallis, uh, of, the, of the way he's willing to make fun of himself. Some of the things are from Phil's life, uh, and some of the things are from Phil's, the lies that he presents as his life. Um, and he has a set of those, and he's very careful to obscure the difference. I, I mean, he wants, he wants to make this a riddle. I mean, it was as though he were writing, you know, sort of private novels for himself, and and so it, it's um, for connoisseurs of, of, well, the word con artist has artist in it, 
And he was an artist at that sort of thing, and he knew it, and he expected his audience to appreciate his performances. Dick's whole life was involved with religion, and his books really um, have a lot of religion in them, uh, often in rather comedic form. There may be a guy up there in a satellite who's controlling your brain. He talks about God in a spray can. This is a kind of metaphor for, well, I suppose that as God I believe to be a human invention, so was the aerosol spray. And Dick saw these things as somehow interchangeable. For Dick, everything, of course, was interchangeable. In the end, of course, well, you have to face the fact, like many a good man, uh, Philip K. Dick went round the bend. That's the honest truth. Uh, and there are those who prefer the round the bend Dick to the, the marvellously sane Dick who saw the bend coming, perhaps, and wrote about that. That's much more interesting. So religion got him in the end, and so did all those drugs. Well, I think he was a different person to different people in a, in a fairly good way in that uh, he had some kind of talent um, to make acquaintances almost immediately think they were fast friends, which is, uh, you know, there are crowds of torn up people at his funeral who you uh, understood he just really remotely known supermarket checkers and bank tellers and stuff like that but somehow everybody had the impression that they were among his closest friends and um, it sounds a little odd I suppose but um, it generally made people feel real good about themselves the, the so-called Philip Dick um, cult of the 80s began with Blade Runner and I don't think that it would have begun or maybe it would have taken 30 extra years had it not been for Blade Runner. Um, the, the movie tie-in edition of the book was and remains far and away the most successful publication with which he was ever involved. It simply uh, reached this mass market that he had never before uh, been able to reach. A new life awaits you in the off-world color. The, the chance, chance to begin, begin again, again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop. Ex-blade runner. Ex-killer. I didn't think he was being fair because he had only seen a few clips, but the impression that he got from them was twofold. He felt that visually and atmospherically they had captured the inside of his brain in an uncanny way that he had he had, had this mental vision of what the scenery would look like and there it was brought to life and he found it quite astonishing and almost disturbing uh, but from what he was able to pick up of the, the dialogue and the um, basic approach to the Deckard character. He felt uncomfortable with it and felt that it had been Hollywoodized. And it was actually rather bitter about that. Philip K. Dick wrote with a hunger to understand what reality was, what it ultimately all meant. And that is a very unfamiliar hunger in this century, where metaphysical questions tend to be treated per se as insane questions. What Philip K. Dick did as a science fiction writer was to expand the bounds of the genre to include the most profound and brilliant metaphysical ideas that have ever been examined, I would say, in science fiction, and at the same time to retain what is great and marvelous about the genre itself, which is the excitement the sense of alien invasion, uh, the sense of talking apparati that interact with human beings, the sense of, of daily confusing life in some imagined future that resembles our own. He merged the two, and he turned them into novels, the like of which we've never seen before.
Joe crossed the waiting room to the Padre booth. Seated inside, he put a dime into the slot and dialed at random. The marker came to rest at Zen. Tell me your torments, the Padre said. Joe said, I, I haven't worked for seven months, and now I've got a job that takes me out of the soul system entirely, and I'm afraid... The Padre's weightless voice floated reassuringly back to him. You have worked and not worked. Not working is the hardest work of all. That's what I get for dialing Zen, Joe said to himself. He switched to Puritan ethic. Without work, the Padre said in a more forceful voice, a man is nothing. He ceases to exist. Rapidly, Joe dialed Roman Catholic. God and God's love will accept you. You're safe in his arms. He will never... Joe dialed Allah. 